Hello, I am Tammy Marshall and welcome back to my channel. Thank you for being here. Today I'm going to read you about the first half of chapter two of my thriller Twinges. This is my most recent book as of the moment at least. Um, if you remember where we left off, Nora, the protagonist, an elementary school teacher, has realized that these twinges that she sometimes feels from her students, her elementary students, where she gets this feeling maybe of what they're going to become, never really gave it a lot of thought before, but now she's learned that one of them has come true, and so she's very, very concerned. Uh, it was at the end of chapter one, we we saw that she had had a twinge recently from one of her young students that he would become a serial killer. And she's, of course, rightfully so, very, very worried. So I'm going to read you, like I said, about the first half of chapter two. I don't want to read, you know, a lot of this book because I do want you to read it, but I do want to share a bit more of it with you in the hopes that you will pick up your own copy of Twinges, paperback or ebook if you prefer, uh, or on Kindle Unlimited, available on Amazon. So here we go, chapter two. Four years ago, there was an opening in one of the elementary schools for a first grade teacher, the age Nora always imagined herself teaching. She applied, got offered the position, and accepted it, happy to leave the crowded middle school behind. She wasn't cut out to deal with the surly attitudes that erupted around the middle of the sixth grade as students prepared to enter junior high. Nora much preferred the innocence and sweetness of children whose ages were still in the single digits. Her first graders often hugged her and a few accidentally called her mom instead of Miss Matthews. She always smiled and attended to the embarrassed student as quietly as possible to not add further humiliation. In actuality, Nora was content to occasionally receive the moniker she'd most likely never legitimately wear, having survived uterine cancer as a teenager. While she hadn't ruled out adoption, Nora didn't much care to go through that process alone. However, currently she was still single, just as she'd been all through college and these first eight years of teaching. Being a mother of sorts to 20 plus seven-year-olds every year suited Nora fine for now. And she knew many lifelong single teachers, men and women, who were seemingly happy with their lots as they headed into retirement alone. Nora wasn't sure if she could be one of them, though. On the other hand, she also wasn't sure she could handle being a mother. With her twinged prediction about Timothy come true, she didn't really want to be able to see her own children's future selves through the simple act of laying a hand on their shoulders. She wouldn't be able to face knowing her own son was going to be a drifter or her daughter homeless or something worse. She wondered, though, if perhaps those futures were written in stone, or if they were as malleable as the clay bricks her students used during art class. Maybe a drifter son could be guided down a meaningful path, and a homeless daughter could be taught the value of wise decisions. On the other hand, what if she were to see astronaut in her daughter's future and then unintentionally ruin that by either pushing science too much on her child or not enough? The possibilities of knowing what the children were to become were too weighty for Nora to imagine. If she really did have some power to see into their futures, she'd prefer not to be a mother. The knowledge of what they were to be would overwhelm her. It was too much for her to bear simply as their teacher for a year, especially when she heard life sentences like drifter and homeless. How was she to face Jeremy every day, imagining he might someday kill people? Nora took a sip of her now cold coffee and grimaced. She shook her head and stood up. I'm being a fool, she told her kitchen. Timothy's heroism is just a coincidence. As she rinsed out her best teacher coffee mug, she prayed she was right about that. On Monday, Jeremy was ill. It was his eighth absence since the start of the school year, and it was only the middle of October. Nora stopped in the office as she headed out to recess duty and asked the attendance secretary, who was also the lunch attendant secretary, Molly, if she knew what was wrong with Jeremy. Molly shrugged and shook her head. His father called in this morning and said that he was sick. That's all I know. Molly began to unwrap her own lunch so she could eat quickly before the students' lunchtime started. Otherwise, she'd be too busy monitoring lunch tickets to have time to eat. Nora frowned. His father... 
I thought he was out of the picture, living in Utah or New Mexico or somewhere down there. She zipped her windbreaker and watched Molly shrug again as she took a small bite of her sandwich. Maybe he's back, Molly said dismissively as she took a larger bite of her sandwich and made a show of looking at the clock. Nora wasn't convinced, but she took the hint. Recess beckoned, so she dropped the subject for now and hurried outside to the black-topped playground. For the next half hour, Nora's attention was preoccupied with tying a few preschooler shoelaces, pushing a shy girl on the swings, refereeing a rambunctious game of kickball, and picking up a few hastily dropped jackets. When the bell to line up to go back into the building sounded, Nora had forgotten all about Jeremy, but she was reminded of him as soon as the students were assembled in their seats for weekly show-and-tell time. It was Jeremy's turn. But since he was absent, there would only be two students sharing items this week instead of three. Nora voiced pity and mentioned that Jeremy could share next week. We can do four then, instead of three. Simon, one of Jeremy's only friends, piped up. It's okay, Miss Matthews. Jeremy doesn't have anything to show anyway. He won't care if we skip him. Nora replied, I'm sure he has something, Simon. She watched as Simon and a couple of other boys looked at each other and then back at her, shaking their heads. The students were paying closer attention to what was being said about Jeremy when he wasn't there than Nora liked to see. We won't worry about it now. I'll discuss it with Jeremy when he's back. Now, which of you would like to go first? Both students, two girls, raised their hands simultaneously and Nora laughed before selecting one of them to present first. To her own ears, though, her laughter lacked mirth. Jeremy was absent the next day and the day after that, so Nora again stopped in the office to discuss his absences with Molly. This time, she chose a time when Molly wasn't busy eating, the students' weekly band and music hour. Again, Molly shrugged. His father called every morning to say that Jeremy is ill. Don't you have to contact the county attorney after the 10th absence? Nora asked with more of a scowl on her face than she intended. Molly cocked her head and raised her eyebrows at Nora. With the slight edge to her voice, she replied, I know how to do my job, Nora. Nora smiled weakly. Of course you do. I'm just worried about Jeremy. Molly's face softened. If he's not here tomorrow, I'll make a call and send someone over to check on him. Thank you. She started to leave but thought of something, so she asked, How do you know it was his father who called? Molly looked puzzled as she answered. He said he was. Nora felt a little prickle at the back of her neck. Have you ever met him? Molly sighed audibly. Nora, really? Do you think I have time to meet every single parent? Nora shrugged. Probably not. For God's sake, the man said he was Jeremy's father and that Jeremy was ill. I believed him. That's all there is to it. Until they find a way to hook a lie detector machine up to my phone, I'm simply going to have to believe people. Molly shifted her gaze away from Nora to her computer screen and began typing away at the keyboard with noticeable intensity. You're right. I'm sorry. As she moved away from Molly's desk, Nora noticed that Dr. Granger, the principal, was studying her intently from the doorway of her office. Catching Nora's eye as she tried to leave, Dr. Granger asked, Everything all right, Miss Matthews? Nora flashed her boss a smile and nodded. Everything's great. She watched Dr. Granger's eyes flit to Molly, who was still typing away like mad, and then back to her. Have a good day, then. The principal turned around and walked to her desk as Nora slipped out of the office and hurried back to her second floor classroom. She entered and approached Jeremy's desk. After scanning its surface, Nora sat in his chair, an action that caused her knees to come up to her chest since the chairs were designed for small children. Nora hunched over and peered into the opening in his desk, which held notebooks, markers, glue, and such. Surreptitiously, she glanced at her open classroom door and then at the large clock on the wall above it. The student still had another 20 minutes of music class. Quietly and carefully, Nora extracted Jeremy's notebooks and riffled through their pages. Those that contained writing were full of Jeremy's loopy handwriting, which became pointed and narrow and hard to decipher when he rushed his work or got frustrated with it. Toward the back of his science notebook, Nora found a page containing something other than writing. She had to look at the drawing for a full minute before she realized it was a picture of a disemboweled cat. It was either that or a bunch of long worms or snakes crawling all over a furry looking thing that resembled a cat. She studied the drawing longer and decided that it definitely was a cat. 
a cat that was most decidedly supposed to be dead. Nora closed the notebook and then placed all of them far back in the cubicle where she'd found them. She felt the notebooks meet up against a small resistance that wasn't part of the desk. Whatever it was, it moved and made a metallic click inside the confines of the desk. She reached back past the stacked notebooks to the very back of the desk's interior and felt around. Her hand lit upon a strap, so she tugged on it and was rewarded with another metallic sound as she pulled the strap toward her from the depths of the desk. As her hand emerged into the light, she was surprised to find herself clutching a small animal collar, the size of which which would fit around a chihuahua's neck or maybe a cat's. She rose from her contorted position and stretched her back as she stepped closer to the window, holding the tiny orange collar. There was a tag on it. That's what had made the clinking sound in the desk. She held the tag up to the strong morning sunlight and squinted to read the engraved letters. Share was printed in block letters on one side of the heart-shaped tag, and on the back in a lightly engraved flowing script was an address. Nora moved to her desk and made a note of the address. Then she returned to Jeremy's desk, but she stopped herself before replacing the collar. Her thoughts began to race. Was this the collar of the dead cat in Jeremy's drawing? Had it been his beloved pet, or had Jeremy been the one who killed it? Was the person at the address on the tag missing his cat and wondering about it? Was it Jeremy's address? She hated to admit that she didn't know where Jeremy or most of her students lived. Usually that was for the best. But in this case, she'd like to know if the caller belonged to a pet that lived or that used to live with Jeremy. She was worried that she was allowing her thoughts to go in crazy directions they wouldn't normally have gone if not for the twinge message she'd received a few weeks ago from Jeremy. Before she could go further with her reverie and before she could safely return the collar, she heard her students approaching the doorway. Nora shoved the collar into her pocket just as Simon burst through the door, towing Jeremy by the wrist behind him. Hope you've enjoyed. Please pick up a copy of Twinges. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.